All right. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, letting me join you today to talk about long-term care and kind of why we're on this effort to get more businesses involved in speaking out and, and writing letters. Um, uh, we're fortunate at Schweitzer Engineering, so I'll, I'll tell you, share real quickly who we are. We're based in Pullman, Washington. We're headquartered there. Uh, we've been there since 1982. And if you were to go to a substation uh, for the power grid, most likely you're gonna see our equipment in there. We're kind of the brains inside the substation that manages the electric grid. Um, and if there's uh, a problem, your power kicks off, uh, most likely it's one of our, our relays or, or something that has kicked your power back on. So we work very closely with all the utilities, um, uh, but we're kind of the brains inside the substation. So no one knows, unless you're in the field, you don't really know exactly what we do. And, and to be honest, I'm still learning exactly what we do because I'm I'm a government affairs guy, not an engineer or anything cool like that. So, um, but that's who we are, and and the reason that we're so interested in, in getting involved in this and and just raising the the alarm is uh, we're we're a NESOP, we're an employee owned company, and um, being a border community, we have about a thousand employees that live in Idaho that work in Washington. Uh, and this really impacts them for the fact that they can't, um, they, they will have to pay into this program, but they do not receive the benefit. Um, so we'll just jump into this. Um, and, and my role real quick is I'm the Washington Government Affairs Manager uh, for SEL. And because most businesses don't have a government affairs team, um, Dr. Schweitzer has tasked me with traveling, making sure to get the word out and lending support to any businesses or chambers that, that may need somebody to help them do research or, or whatever. And I'm happy to do that. So that's kind of our role and, and why we're raising the alarm. And we think business, uh, Washington continues to be less business friendly. We want to make sure we can try and turn that that tide and, and make the governor understand uh, how policies are impacting us and make sure legislatures understand how uh, policies impacting us as well. All right, so I'm going to, uh, we're going to jump to a present, uh, a PowerPoint and then um, we'll get started. So let me share my screen. Green. And let me know if you see it. Can you see it? Yep, we see it. Perfect. All right, let's do this. It's going to let me. Okay. Um, so going back real quick. This is our government affairs team, just so you know. Dr. Schweitzer, our founder and president, um, still very much involved, uh, but he wants you to know that you can contact him. So there's his email address. It, I promise you it goes directly to him if you have questions. Uh, Eric Newman is our government affairs director. Um, he may be joining us as well uh, for this. And then I'm the regional government affairs manager and Haley is our, our government affairs specialist. Um, so this is our contact information and feel free to reach out to us at any time um, on this or other issues that impact businesses because chances are we're trying to pay attention to it and, and Dr. Schweitzer is not afraid to speak out and uh, on behalf of business. Um, so we'll do a brief overview uh, and then just kind of why it's important to write a letter. Um, so let me... We're going to watch a quick video to give you an overview, and then I want to just take any questions uh, after we discuss kind of the impacts to businesses. Let me see if I can get this video working for us. It may take just a second.
The following slides provide a brief overview of the Washington Long-Term Services and Supports Trust Program. The information presented here is based on what we know as of April 15, 2021. Further guidance, including final regulations, may cause the information to change. What is the program? The Long-Term Services and Supports Trust Program was enacted by the Washington Legislature in 2019 and is being revised in 2021. It provides for a modest level of long-term care, also known as LTC, benefits. The initial benefit covers $100 a day up to a lifetime maximum of $36,500. It covers services such as adult daycare, memory care, adaptive equipment, in-home care, assisted living, and nursing home services. Benefits are paid when an individual cannot perform three of 10 activities of daily living. We'll talk more about them later. Benefits are paid after private long-term care insurance is exhausted and before Medicaid eligibility. You can read the legislation by clicking the Read the Bill button on this page. How is the program funded? A premium assessment will be deducted from the wages of most Washington W-2 workers. That means those workers who are not self-employed. The initial assessment is 58 cents per $100 of wages per year with no income cap. Deductions begin January 1st, 2022. Who can receive benefits? To qualify for trust benefits, you must have worked and contributed to the trust for at least 10 years at any point in your life without a break of five or more years within those 10 years or three of the last six years. And you must have worked at least 500 hours per year during those years. To be eligible to receive benefits, you must be a current Washington resident and need assistance with at least three of the following activities of daily living, which are also known as ADLs. Qualifying activities of daily living include medication management, cognitive impairment, personal hygiene, toileting, eating, transfer assistance, ambulation or mobility, bathing, body care, and dressing. Is the program mandatory? Most W-2 workers in Washington will be automatically included in the program. Premium deductions will begin January 1st, 2022. However, there is an opportunity to apply for a permanent exemption from the program. Individuals who are already covered by a qualifying long-term care insurance policy may apply to the Employment Security Department for an exemption from the premium deduction and future benefits. They must have purchased their policy prior to November 1st, 2021. If you want to be exempt from the state plan, there are several important dates you should keep in mind. If you have a long-term care policy, you may apply for a permanent exemption beginning October 1st, 2021. The application period continues through December 31st, 2022. It is important to act right away as payroll deductions continue until the first day of the quarter following approval of the exemption application. You must purchase a qualifying policy before November 1st, 2021. Payroll deductions will begin January 1st, 2022. January 1st, 2025 is the date that benefits will be available to those who qualify. Please note, the dates shown here are based on what was known as of April 15, 2021. They may change as further guidance and final regulations become available. Okay. I'll switch back to... Okay, so... That's just kind of a brief overview. Um, and so why should we be concerned about the long-term care tax? Um, like I said, for, for Pullman and for anybody working remotely that has a W-2 in 
Washington, they will be taxed on this, but unable to receive the benefit. Um, and so the lifetime benefit as well as 36,500. And so what that equals out to is $100 per day for a year. Uh, so if you enter the workforce at the age of 18 and you are on the state plan and you are in the workforce in Washington for 40 years, the max you will, you will ever get is $36,500. Uh, and then if you are uh, going to be retiring here in the next two or three years. You will pay into it starting uh, January 1st, 2022. And if you retire within you know, two or three years of that, you will not be able to receive the benefit as well. It, benefits don't start paying out until uh, 2025. Um, and then another, another portion of this that uh, that is, is really concerning is the Office of the State Actuary actually concluded that this program will be about $15 billion short. So they won't be, as of right now, there's not even uh, the funds in there and they don't expect the funds to last through uh, the, the program's life. And um, because of that, we actually do anticipate that they'll raise the tax uh, eventually and want to, um, I apologize, someone's alarm's going off. Um, and, and that could impact businesses down the road as well. There is nothing preventing them from raising the tax or eventually changing this to a tax on businesses instead. Uh, so there's a lot going on with this bill that, that's not great, um, but that's kind of what we, what we know at this point. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I think Eric jumped on. I'm not sure. Um, anyone have any questions? I do, Brian. This is Andrea from the Seattle Southside Chamber. I think they're, yeah. they're just having some technical difficulties and we couldn't see the video. I don't know if that was just me, went, but I couldn't oh. see the video when you were playing it. I think because you open the video, then you have to share a new screen and, um, you know, it's Friday the 13th. <laughs> So, oh, um, there you, go. you know, uh, but could you, is there a link to the video? Like, is there a YouTube link or something to the video where yeah. we could, okay, you can put that in. We'll send you, I'll send you guys a copy of this presentation. And I apologize for that. I didn't realize that was the case. Um, uh, we'll send you a link to this presentation and it has it embedded in there. So you can click on it and see the video. Um, so I'll send that out. Um, right after we're done so you can get it out to everyone that's joined and anybody else that may wanna see the presentation. Ryan? Ryan, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great, this is Tony from City of Tukwila. Um, I do understand that the maximum benefit is 36,500. Is there a max or a cap to the contributions or would we be perhaps con contributing significantly more than 36,500 in the course of our career but only pulling out that amount? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it is a 0.58% per $100 premium. So it'll be, if you're making $100,000, it's $580 a year. And as you go up, it's 0.58% it's of, uh, of your salary. So whatever that is throughout your lifetime, it just goes with you and raises as you increase your salary or whatnot. So there is no cap and no limit on that. If, if we were successful in being able to opt out of this program, but then left our current employer and went to a different job, would we opt out, have to go through the opt out process a second time? No, the opt out process is a one time process. So as of right now, um, no, you have until November 1st to purchase a long term care plan. And, and, and have it set up. So what we're hearing from the insurance companies, if you can find a policy, is it's gonna take about six to eight weeks to do underwriting. So you, I mean, it's a very, very short window, one to two weeks that people probably need to start applying for a plan so that they can get through the underwriting process and have a policy in place by November 1st. If it's not in place by November 1st, then you won't be able to opt out you will be forced onto the state plan. The, 
the long-term care plan is not, not portable. So if you move out of state, even if you paid into it for 40 years and decided to retire somewhere else, uh, you would not be able to take it with you. And um, it, it can transfer employer, you, if you change jobs, you can transfer if you've opted out, but you've got to make sure you take your exemption letter with you and give it to your new employer. Otherwise, you'll be opted, you'll be put back on the state plan and start paying into it because your new employer wouldn't know that you changed, that you opted out. So it's on the employee to make sure their employers know they've received their opt out exemption. Brian, Thank can, you. Can, can I interject here for a second? Because yeah, most, unfortunately, most um, individual plans, really this last seven days, the companies have pulled out. So there's very few um, individual options to be able to get an opt out anymore. There, there are still a few, <clears throat> Um, but the companies are pulling out every day. Like today, another couple companies are just closing down, closing out. So yeah. there are, um, there are, there are a very few individual opt-out programs, but there are some um, group voluntary programs still available. So if a company has five or less, um, excuse me, five employees that are willing to enroll, then you can get a plan, you know, for your employees. So you know, uh, I could, I'm an I'm an insurance agent, so I'm dealing on the front lines. You know, with all this, yeah. Every day's companies are pulling out. It's it's it's, be, it's a very different, uh, difficult environment right now. So, Richard, I have a council member Clyde Hill from the city of SeaTac who has his hand raised. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. Um, Clyde Hill here. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. So, I as I understand it, uh, with no upper limit. Um, maximum limit. So if an individual has two jobs, they're going to be paying the, the taxes out of both of those income streams. And then if you can clarify, I heard opt out once. So if an individual enrolls and gets the letter of opt out and should happen to decide to cancel their private insurance carrier, they are still opted out. Is that correct? That is our understanding. Once you opt out, you are permanently opted out. Okay, there's so, no audit process. Okay, cool. Uh, as of right now, there's not, no. But but they are anticipating that could change. Of course. <laughs> yeah, once they once they discover that loophole. All right, thank you. Yeah. 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 Regulation. And, and, and Richard, maybe you can help us on this as well. But the other part is that the rules are still being written. It's kind of a moving target. So even the plan for SEL that, that we've offered to our employees, there is a notification on there that says, there is no guarantee that this plan qualifies for Washington State's long-term care program or, or to opt out of Washington State's long-term care program. The rules are still being written. Right. You'll be able to apply for an exemption from October 1st to November 1st. That is the very short window we have. Um, and, and as of right now, there's no clarification for the insurance companies exactly what those rules are. Uh, so it's kind of a moving target and we're all just doing our best to get the message out and, and people that want to opt out to be able to opt out. C correct, yeah, the regulations are, have not been completed. Uh, there's pretty good theory, here, pretty a good idea what will happen, but it's not clear, fully clear. It also includes, um, by the way, for business owners, it also includes um, S corporations, uh, W-2 compensation. So business owners with a, um, um, an S corp and obviously a corporation will be included in that tax. Check with your CPA. I'm understanding that members of an LLC might, be, not, might not be included, but I'm a little bit wary on that just uh, to check out that. And then also, I would, I think that's relevant is I was hoping they would kick the can in and give us another opportunity to opt out starting January 1st, like when they meet again in January and kick it out until June. But one of the, um, my colleagues who was trying to negotiate with the legislator, legislature, she said, apparently they didn't even want an opt out. They wanted to have it from 2019. If you didn't have an LTC plan, you couldn't have an opt out. So I don't know if they're going to even extend that opt out. So it's a little bit, uh, you know, 
Yeah. So, so our understanding what's happening. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. And our understanding is 2019, there was no opt out limits. So when the bill was originally written, you could opt out at any time uh, that you decided to purchase a plan in 2021, because I think they realized people would be opting out and it would even make it harder for it to be solvent uh, to, to even have the funds in there to do what they're hoping it does. They put in an opt out date. Our understanding was they had looked at July 25th. Mm -hmm. Then there was a big push to try and push it to December or December right. 31st. And they decided to compromise and put November 1st. So that's a very short window for people to, uh, get a plan, which is very hard to find, and opt out. And so the hope that we're doing is, and, and I'll share this uh, again as well, Dr. Schweitzer wrote, has written two letters now to Governor Inslee asking him to um, put a delay on implementation of this bill and work with the legislature to, in the short term, find solutions to these issues. And um, Part of the argument now as we're developing it even more is that the market has collapsed for this product and and that should be enough to, to have them put a delay. Um, but then long-term, we would hope that this actually gets repealed because this is a, a product that the government is forcing people to purchase uh, that they may not even want or use. Um, and so uh that's something that we we strongly are encouraging people to do is write letters to the governor we'd love to see physical letters written to the governor so he has stacks of thousands of letters um because it's a, a a better visual representation if it goes to an email it'll still get to his staff um but having letters pile up is a is a different factor that they have to be mindful of so that's why we're trying to encourage people to engage, write letters, have their employees write letters, uh, because this is such, this is going to impact everybody, and and it's just not a good program for the needs. We're not saying long-term care isn't important and there aren't people that need it. This is just not the way to go about it. Brian, we have Dan Hammes has his hand up with a question. Okay. So I, I realize that we have a lot of small businesses and um, independent operators within our chambers. Um, and sometimes they have part-time employees that are there just short time. Um, if one is how, how are they, they're being, individual operators are being treated as employees and they have to figure out their gross income and pay the tax, I assume. And it, is there any compensation for all the tracking that's going to have to happen for businesses that have to track all these employees coming and going? It will be, it is on the employee to make sure that their employer has the note. The employer does have to keep, once they have the, the exemption letter from ESD, the employer has to keep track of that note as long as those people are employed. But it really is up to uh, the employee to to apply for the opt out, and then once they receive their their letter from ESD, to make sure their employer has that information so that they can uh, show that opt out if they were to get uh, audited or checked to make sure that that employee doesn't need to pay the tax. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I was just, I'm, I'm just thinking of Kenny right next door to the Brenton Chamber. He has a lot of part-time employees, plus he's a single operator. He's going to have to pay his own tax based on his, what he, he figures his wage is, mm -hmm. even as he is the owner of the organization, the company, so. Um, if, if you are the, if you are um, a small business owner, I believe there is an, a, uh, an opt out that you can, you have to opt in, I think. So if you're not a W-2 and you're, you, then you have to opt in. If, if you are a W-2 or get a W-2, uh, so an S-Corp that, that pays and get a W-2, 
those are who are going to be paying this tax. Mm -hmm. um, so federal employees are exempt. And then small business owners, I think my understanding is that they have to actually opt into the program. Um, so if they if they don't pay themselves a W-2, they have to opt into it. So they're exempt as well. Um, but once they opt in, I think they opt in for life is my understanding as well. Correct. So the W-2 is kind of the key to know if you're going to have to pay it or not. Um, if you receive a W-2 in Washington, so if you do have, if you have remote employees that work in a different state, but the W-2 is coming out of Washington, those employees are going to be paying into it. And like I said, if you live, you in order to qualify, you have to be a Washington resident. So if you live in a different state, you will not receive the benefit. Um, if you're close to retirement, you're not going to receive the benefit. Um, and then anyone that's going to be entering the workforce after the age or after November 1st. So if you, you have a 17 year old that's going to enter the workforce, mm -hmm. they are going to be forced onto the plan as of right now. Um, and Representative Joe Schmick, who is ranking member on health care uh, in the House, is currently working on a bill to address some of those issues. Uh, but again, our hope is to, to send a strong business message to the to the governor that this is this is a bad idea, asking him to delay it, delay the implementation, um, and work with the legislature to find fixes for this bill. Uh, and then long-term goal is that we hope that eventually it's it's fully repealed. But um, but if we can at least get some fixes into it and a delay, that would allow people to have a chance to actually opt out. Um, but we do think it's important. We think a grassroots effort of getting businesses to share can send a strong message. And we want that to happen. We think the governor needs to hear from us. Uh, and so the employers and the employees sending letters is exactly what we're hoping for. And, and what I'll do is send a copy of this presentation and then uh, both letters that Dr. Schweitzer sent. And then we have a template as well people can use. It makes it real easy for them to um, kind of plug and play and, and personalize the, the note to them. So there, it looks like there's a couple other questions uh, possibly in the chat. I think the questions in the chat were about having sample letters and it sounds like you're going to be doing those. I guess I just have, and I don't mean this to be a rhetorical question, Ryan, but you know, we were pretty actively engaged in this in the legislative session, right? You know, everything still passed. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, without sounding incredibly skeptical, you know, what, what do we hope to accomplish by sending, you know, letters now, you know, after, after the fact? I think our lawmakers already know what the position of the business, you know, community is. Um, certainly, you know, doing a grassroots effort to make it, you know, more, more personal, I think, has, has merit as we start to go into the next legislative session. But it's not like we can stop this freight train in November, correct? This is just about getting and setting the groundwork for a more successful legislative session in January, or correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, it, it's both. Okay. Um, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's uh, a lot of people, a lot of the, either the chambers, AWB, and some employers were aware of this and did fight this. Um, we had some people working with us that were part of that group to kind of push back the opt-out date to November 1st, um, but they didn't, they didn't listen. And that was the tough part about this last session is they were able to kind of push through whatever they wanted. And, the, and the, it wasn't an easy way to communicate concerns that they uh, responded to well. Um, but what we are learning as well is that the majority leader Billig uh, is hearing from a lot of people and feeling pressure on this. He now has concerns about it. Um, so I think the, the pressure is building. Um, Lieutenant Governor Denny as well is hearing from people. He was unaware, uh, as far as we know, about two weeks ago, unaware of the impacts to business uh, and to the employees. Um, Governor Inslee, some of his staff, um, 
are now just learning the impacts to employees and, and uh, what that will do to people. So it's almost, we're, we're starting to get momentum. We're starting to, we want to build that pressure so that they feel like, okay, we have to address this. If we can get them to do a delay um, and work out a uh, some sort of delay plan to address the issues and push back the November 1st deadline, that would be awesome. Whether or not they can, they can or will do it, we're not sure. But what we do know is that businesses stepping up and employees partnering with their business, with their employers to send a really strong message will have an impact. Um, and if we can get a good grassroots effort, I think we can at least buy some time to do some work in the next session. But, but it's also, you know, Washington, it's starting to feel like uh, it's, it's death of a thousand cuts for businesses. Um, they're constantly under attack with new taxes, new regulations. Um, and we're really hoping that momentum from this can carry on to make sure businesses know, let's stand up and speak out more. Um, the chambers do a great job of trying to get that message out there, but it's even stronger for chambers if their members stand side by side with them and also speak up and speak out. Um, so that's what we're, that's what, that's our hope. I don't know if, I don't know how much it will happen, but, but our hope is that we can engage and we're fortunate to be in a position to be able to help more. Uh, and so those small, like I said, those small businesses, they don't, they don't have a government affairs team. So they rely on the chambers and a lot of chambers are the smaller chambers, especially are one or two person shows and they don't have a huge capacity. Uh, and so we want to be there to help however we can. Uh, and that's what we're hoping to do here. Um, Brian, this is Eric uh, Newman from SEL as well. I apologize for being late, but just to add to Brian's comments, um, I think there's a lot of power in numbers and businesses and individuals are just now waking up to the problems of this law. I mean, we're, we're finding that as we talk to businesses and chambers across the state. Um, Brian probably mentioned that we had information sessions with 600 of our 2,600 Washington employees. None of them wanted this and are asking us to fight on their behalf. On top of that, 400 emails into our human resources group uh, with folks just livid um, about this. We have of our 2,600 Washington state employees, 1,000 live in Idaho and are going to be forced to buy a plan they don't want and don't need um, just to be able to have something that's portable and, and have a benefit. And I think we're kind of viewing this too is like enough's enough. The degradation of our economic and political freedom and, and just the, we need to stand up for free enterprise. That's what, you know, I think chambers are, are all about. Um, and there's strength in numbers and there wasn't a lot of, and I know several people were engaged during the session and, and during 2019, but there, there, there wasn't, a, there wasn't, um, I think broad support as we were talking with AWB, uh, yesterday, um, they didn't get a lot of feedback and comment in 2019 from businesses uh, about this law. Um, and we ourselves, we're just, uh, we're fairly new. We've got a lot of new folks in our government affairs team, including myself, and are just waking up to this. And um, and so that's why Dr. Schweitzer is calling on Governor Inslee to stop the law. And so we say, well, what can the governor do to stop the law? Well, I think that he can do several things. Um, certainly, he hasn't been reticent to use his emergency powers under the pandemic uh, to delay implementation or um, issue proclamations to change things. You could pick up the phone and call Speaker Jenkins and express his extreme displeasure about how this program is hurting Washingtonians and asking her to fix it. Um, I know there are calls for a special session on transportation, and I also saw some stuff the uh, day before yesterday um, to address some of the um, uh, uh, confusion around a lot of the crime legislation. That could be a way um, to get this in to, to get a fix or at least to get a delay in until it can be handled in a special session. I think there's lots that can be done. And I don't think um, anyone will act unless they feel enough pressure. 
So that's I'll get off my soapbox now. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's kind of how um, my view of the world right now. Brian, there's a um, a comment in the chat um, from Councilmember Clyde Hill. It says, and, and Mr. Hill, if you'd like to take yourself off mute and ask the question, that would be great. But it com- it's about the W-2s. Right. Uh, my interest was to reconfirm what I thought I heard, that if your W-2 comes from a Washington State company or corporation, that you will be automatically paying into this fund, regardless if you reside in Washington State or not. Um, currently, I'm not hearing that at my primary employer, uh, T-Mobile. T-Mobile is offering their employees a, a commercial plan, um, which I'll be diving into a little bit later. But um, I, I, what I've perceived is they're directing that to Washington State employees and not bringing a concern to our out-of-state workforce, which, uh, for instance, Kansas City, since uh, T-Mobile merged with Sprint, that's a huge workforce base, which will be getting their pay from a Washington State Corporation, which they'll be paying into. So please reconfirm if what I heard is true. If you get a W-2 from Washington State, you're paying into the program. That's correct. That's our understanding. And that's uh, what we've been, uh, we've confirmed over and over again. So if the W-2 comes out of Washington State, you are going to pay into it if you don't opt out before November 1st. Right. And you'll never receive the benefit unless you move into Washington State. Correct. All right. Thank you. Yes. All right. We can keep talking. I I want to go just real quickly to kind of what we're talking about with the letter writing and just do real briefly what we think that that looks like and, and what that means. Um, and the one thing is, Andrea, as, as you talked about, it's never too late to make sure your voice is heard and your opinions are heard. The legislature works for us and we wanna make sure that we, even if they pass something that, that was opposed, they still need to continue to hear. Um, and uh, I, I think that's really important. As a former Senate staffer, I used to work for a US Senator, we would hear a lot from people. And I do know that um, the more that come in, the more impact it has and the, the more we go, okay, this is something that people are really listening to. So um, making sure your voice is heard is extremely important. And that's what we're hoping to do here. Um, so real quickly, how do I write a letter? Don't bury the lead. Um, express how you how this tax is going to neg- negatively impact you. Um, make sure that it's right out there up front so that they see it right away. Um, and then be frank with them and, and to the point. Um, don't don't be afraid to say it how it is. And then share your your personal stories. Who are you? What does your business do? Make sure that allow them to connect with you. Um, If you're small, how many employees do you have? If you're big, how many employees do you have? Um, Personalize that message and then circle back to the main point of why you're writing. Um, But but personalizing the letter makes a big difference. There are form letters that go out and those also make a difference, but but there is an impact and and a way the personalizing it really connects with them or can connect with them. And when you send the letter to Governor Inslee, I would suggest you send it to your, your state representatives that are in your district, as well as the leadership. Uh, so on the Democrat side, it would be Speaker Jenkins and Majority Leader Andy Billig in the Senate. And on the, the Republican side, it is uh, JT Wilcox is the minority leader in the House and John Braun is the minority leader in the Senate. Um, so send it to Governor Inslee, but also make sure the others hear your voice as well. Um, and then real simple, aim for one page, rely on the facts, be, be courteous and informative, uh, and end with a real clear call to action and, uh, make sure you sign and, and send that letter off. 
Um, like I said, email is great. You can also do email. Um, there's there's uh, the possibility that there may be an effort to do a an online petition of sorts um, that we've that we've heard about. I'm trying to find out more about that if that's a possibility. Uh, but we really do believe a physical letter to the governor and and stacking it high would be a, a huge impact. And so that's what we're hoping for um, with these letters and why we're encouraging people to reach out and and support the chambers and their efforts and and uh, send out send them strong, clear message and make sure your employees know because this is really going to help them, uh, hit them as well. So. Um, and then here's some resources. And like I said, I'll send this presentation out to you so that you have all of this information. And once again, we're the SEL team and you can reach out to any of us at any time uh, on this or other issues. And we're happy to, to work with you and, and help. So um, I want to, I'm trying to be mindful of everyone's time and I know we have about five minutes left. So are there any other questions or concerns that we have an answer that we could or anything else? Brian, this is Diane. I wanted, I do want to say that, you know, one of the, the main difference between now and, and when the legislature passed this was we have so many companies that are pulling out and it's making it more difficult to get that product, which is maybe a factor that wasn't in consideration at the time this, the, the bill passed. And I also want to, um, into the chat, uh, Ro uh, Richard Tobin from uh, Sheriff Financial has put his information. In the meantime, if you're looking for plans and, and he can can help you with, with that process as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look at those, uh, yeah, Richard and, and others that are dealing with this. They're on the front lines of this and they're seeing, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard for them to do their job because things they could offer yesterday are now gone today. And um, it's a, a, it's like I said, a moving target. We still don't know all of the rules. ESD is still writing the rules on this. Um, and, and I do think that's part of why it makes sense to ask them to delay is the market is just collapsing. Um, mm -hmm. And the availability to do thing to to have a plan is much more difficult than it was, and and Richard and everyone else that's involved is trying to keep up on what they can offer and what they can't, and it's just uh, extremely difficult. Yeah, extremely. I want to go back, Brian. Ask one quick question um, yeah. because it came up during T-Mobile's comments, but you know, we, employees who are out of state. Or they're not supposed to be getting charged. But I'm wondering, because a lot of companies do have people who move from state to state and we're a much more fluid environment than we used to be. Mm -hmm. If we have an employee that comes from out of state, are they automatically in the system and they don't have the option to opt out when they come in? That's a good question. Yeah. If you have a new employee that's that's going to join the team after November first, they're automatically enrolled. There's no opt out option at this point for them. So um, that was a concern brought up yesterday with the Moses Lake Chamber is that this could make it a tad harder to recruit because there will be a tax. If you know if if they're coming in and they didn't want to have to pay for long term care, sorry, you're going to be paying for it after November first. Um, if 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 you have people that are joining your company, but still living in a different state, after November 1st, they will be automatically enrolled. There's no option to opt out. So it's, uh, it, it's gonna impact every employee that, that, that works, gets a W-2 from Washington. And you should know all just to put in there if if um, companies want a group plan, there's groups under th discussions with one of my colleagues is groups under 30 might have another 
maybe two weeks or th to start getting a plan into place, maybe middle of September, uh, maybe for um, groups above that size. But literally, I get sometimes three, three hours notice that a, a, a company's pulling out, carriers pulling out, maybe it's a couple, a couple days, it's been a week, but they could pull out at any second. There's very few plans you know, left for individual and there's not too many on the group side. It's pretty crazy. It's like a battle zone. It's really, it's pretty wild. Yeah, it's, uh, that's what we're urging people to not only pay attention and, and look for options right now, but also um, we need to speak out and speak up and see if we can get something delayed before November 1st, yeah. simply so people even uh, can find something if they do want to opt out. Right now, that's just so much more difficult. I had a, oh, sorry. I just had a question I put it in the chat for everyone who's on. Does anyone have any statistics on how many insurance companies are and who they were who pulled out in the recent weeks out of this market? I think that would be a compelling stat to add to our advocacy of being able to make the point that the um, the market is collapsing. Yeah. I, I can give you a I can give you a list. I don't know about the statistics. <laughs> the uh, list would be great, Richard. I'd appreciate that. Yeah, any any in, any information you have would be awesome. Yeah, I'll be in touch. I mean, I don't know okay. if I have them all, but I got a pretty good sense and representation of them. Great, yeah. thank you. And I did reach out to the department, the insurance commission yesterday to ask that question, and I have not heard anything back. So, if I hear something back, I'll share that as well. Um, uh, with you, Richard, and to the rest of the group. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's it's happening every day. So Literally. I think that list will just be a running list at this point. Yeah, I canceled my vacation last week. We were supposed to go away for uh, two, three days, but then also got the announcements, which is we had to cancel it. <laughs> you know, it was like less than a, a week. And then like days, things would be, you know, shutting off and carriers pulling out. L largely two things is they don't want that much business. They go, oh, first of all, they can't handle that much business is one problem. Second of all, a lot of it is not good business because a lot of people are just looking to opt out. So they're looking for tiny plans, which really messes up the underwriting and, you know, the way that they make decisions. So that became an additional problem. So some of them were raising their minimums we saw and making it better, you know, better planning, but then they just got flooded I think NGL said they got more applications in three days earlier this week than they get in three months. And it's just becoming unbearable for them. And that's Clyde, if I could do a follow up to that. So as the insurance companies pull out um, their offering uh, for Washington based uh, consumers that might have enrolled in that plan, does that mean that they're left high and dry or are they, they honored and it's just no longer commercially offered to other new prospective clients? Yeah, I, yeah, I want to be, clarify that. So two things. One is they're pulling the product. So they're not just saying to people who already applied, too bad. They just can't take more business. So that that's what I, I should have said. There are... Um, They've been letting advisors know that some of the later business, they can't guarantee. So they're giving like, when we think we can handle it, when we can't think we can handle it. So there, there's no guarantees in the ones getting in later right now. But um, it, it, it's, it's, we don't know the regulations. We don't know. There's a lot of questions going on. But the insurance companies, at least my sense is, are is doing the best that they can to handle the business and put it through and work with us as agents. So that, that's what I'm experiencing. So, but it's, it's, ch it's challenging. They're swamped. Yeah, we, we are, we did hear of an example, the uh, Pullman School District had a plan that they worked on in April with a company to, to get long-term care for their employees an option. And they were notified, right. well, I wanna say last Thursday that the, the company decided to cancel that policy and, and is not going to do that policy for them. Really? So now they're left, they're left scrambling, trying to find something new, but that plan they had worked on back in April to have it in place. And now it's 
it's uh, it's gone for them. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a call, Brian. I'm, I'm just curious what kind of plan that might have been. It might have been a robust plan, and then they were getting in too. They were getting too many um, applications in for the minimum, and that might be why they pulled out. Like for Allstate, they don't have a traditional um, long-term care plan. They have a work site, uh, like a life insurance with LTC, so the risk is not as great. I don't think. So I'm just curious what company it was and what you know. I can do some research why they pulled out. So I'm more aware. Be interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly who that is, but I could put you in touch with with uh, superintendent over there, and he might be able to help you. Okay, just good to keep up with me. Well, I will make sure um, if there's not any other questions, I'll make sure that we get the slide deck to you. We'll get you a template for the letters and both of Dr. Schweitzer's letters uh, as well. Feel free to you know, pull from those, but but definitely we encourage you to stay engaged, speak out, write the governor, um, make sure your legislators also here and um, make sure that the business voice is being heard. And um, the more we can do, the, the bigger the voice, I think the more pressure they're going to feel to address the, the issues and the concerns. So that's why we're doing this. We think this it's time to speak out and, and we're tired of we're tired of sitting back and 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 we just need to make sure that the that our chamber partners and those that support us that we're supporting them and helping them as well and, and let your employees know because a lot of employees don't know a lot of business owners are not letting their employees know so there's they're not crying out and also a lot of business owners don't know i'm it's, as i talk to business owners it's they're not familiar and they think i'm pressuring them what's it's incredible is i'm letting people know this company's pulling out, these companies are pulling out in another two or three days. And people think it's just a sales technique. And I'm just like, no, I'm just trying to let you know what's going on. And then they call you back a few days later. And it's like, what can we do? And it's like a lot less than we could have done when I was trying to give you the alert. And, and people are not grasping it because it's not in the press and people just don't believe it. And it, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance in, in this actually happening and being able to happen. Brian, thank you very much for the information. And Richard, thank you very much for being able to, to, to share your expertise as well. We will send a note to everybody with the um, recording from today with the slide deck with the various attachments that Brian has uh, referenced. We'll also send out uh, the contact information for SEL as well as contact information for Richards, um, if you wanna find out about what plans might exist. If, are there any other questions for today? Okay, seeing as none, we will send the information out. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for being here today and everybody, thank you for your time and, and energies and, and coming to the presentation this morning. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Brian. You. Thank you.